from the Martin Siegel Theater Center in Midtown, uh, Manhattan, in New York City. My name is Frank, Frank Henschker, the director of the Siegel Center. And um, as many of you know, we have done for months now, since March, actually spoken to artists uh, um, about this time of Corona. After a break in uh, September, we went back and opened up the conversations to uh, thinkers, producers, curators, academics, and uh, and researchers uh, to see what's going to happen now, what are we doing, and where are we um, at, at the moment. Um, uh, of course, we all know today is a great day, uh, perhaps, you know, it might be the day where we have a change in Washington and the political um, landscape. We all have been always shocked, especially people in the arts, um, by what is happening by our political leadership, presidents who had to inject uh, disinfectant, who wanted to send military against his own people who were protesting peacefully. And, um, and now uh, is openly uh, asking not to count votes, the stuff we normally hear from dictatorial countries, um, but we all have faced that this will be um, a, 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 a peaceful transition of power. Um, artists have always been uh, close observers of reality of the moment, capture reality, but also uh, with imagination in a symbolic way, but, but also in a real way. And they have been close to the struggle of freedom, of uh, the, the, they have been on the right side of history, that complex uh, uh, history. And, um, and if there's ever a time, I think, you know, where we have to, again, listen to what artists say and what they see and where they have something to say, it is now where we are thrown back to our existential questions about what are we doing? Where do we come from? Where are we? Where are we going to? And um, in our book uh, at the Siegel Center, as the idea of a Joseph Boys of an enlarged definition of art, producers, dramaturgs, curators, artistic directors, they are artists, they collage things, they put things together, they create communities, and their work is a, a significant one because they create exactly that what we are missing so terribly now, and we feel what we are missing uh, because we know about it. And... Um, and uh, we all miss being in a room, the chatter of an opening night, and sounds of bodies um, in a room, and exchanges and thoughts. And uh, one of the people in New York City who creates such spaces, who creates such community, who brings people together from around the world, as we try to do also a little bit in our tiny center to bridge academia, professional theater, but international and global theater and America. And New York theaters. This is something that our guests are so wonderfully and great. With us today, we have Susan Feldman from the great uh, St. Anne's uh, Warehouse, where she is the president and artistic director. And for over 40 years, she has worked in New York City. It's a long time, it's four decades. Um, she has transformed uh, uh, spaces into cultural destinations from the St. Anne's Church, yes, it started there, to uh, now the historic tobacco warehouse. And one of the greatest uh, uh, producers and present, not present producers, but presenters mostly of international work in the, in the Americas. And uh, the names of artists she had is uh, almost like a who is who. John Gale, uh, Lou Reed, Marion Faithful. Um, they had uh, Gregor Serginia from the TR Varsova, uh, Mark Rylands. Uh, uh, Charlie Kaufman, the Cone Brothers, uh, the Donmar Warehouse, the great Donmar Warehouse um, with the old Shakespeare trilogy, the Young Vic, uh, the Neil Fishes, Oklahoma. I remember that the great The Jungle from the Gates Theater, uh, Stephen Daldry, uh, Dublin's uh, uh, Hamlet of uh, with Yael Fabre and Ruth uh, Negar. So and the, the list goes on and on and. Um, Everybody has been there, has seen it. We are so happy and grateful that this space got created, renovated, and barely when it opened up, um, in a way, it was put on full breaks. So with us today, Susan, thank you for, for coming and for joining us and also being in a live conversation. I know um, that's uh, different what normally happens, but you know, all our respect for everything you have done for the city, for the communities, and um, where are you and how, how are you doing in these days? Um, I think I think I'm doing I think I'm doing OK. It's been it's been a long time now, like since March. Um, I'm actually right now out in in Montauk. I just came out last night um, just to get some ocean air 
and to breathe a little, um, a little bit. I, ca I came out here uh, about six weeks after the pandemic started, after we closed down. And, it, you know, it's really kind of life-saving um, for me. Uh, I've had a hard time, like many people, um, the, uh, the overwhelming sense of loss that I think we as a, as a community and as a culture felt and feel, um, especially at the beginning. I, I had personal issues with fam a family member. My sister's very ill. Uh, so that was a big part and that happened at the same time as the beginning of the pandemic and then and then um, and then closing you know closing the theater terrible having to furlough people lay off people we were able to keep people through June that was really good um, you know I would say there's a lot of um, a lot of loss but at the same time um, and also I have to we lost a couple of very, very um, important people to us. Hal Wilner, who is a music producer that had a very big hand in helping define who we became as an institution with this whole rock and roll um, history that we have from being in the church. We lost Hal and then uh, Jane Walentis, who uh, created Jane's Carousel and was, I call her the first lady of Dumbo. She and her husband, David, created Dumbo. Um, Adam Max, who was you know, one of our great board members and he was the chairman of BAM. So, you know, in terms of the grief, it's been, you know, very difficult. Um, but in terms of how people have come together and our international community, you know, there's a lot of support. I feel a tremendous amount of support coming from overseas right now with our election. It's, it's incredible how important what happens to us as a cultural community and as a country in, in America, how much it affects our artists and people that we're so close to. Um, you know, so I've heard from Jagar, who, who you just mentioned, and Emma Rice and I, you know, were able to do a conversation, which was really nice. And um, Paul Fahi at the Galway um, International Festival and Ann Clark from Landmark. Enda Walsh, I speak to Enda, you know, every, every month or so. So, and then, you know, I get to see now that, you know, we're able to eat outdoors and meet, meet outdoors. It's been great. You know, I, um, Eric uh, Wallen and I, Eric's our general manager, and I, you know, we had dinner the other night with uh, Liz LeCompte and uh, Kate Falk. Um, so, you know, we're, we're able to start talking and thinking about a, a, a future. And I think that that's been, that's been a change. Um, so we shut down uh, middle of March. The building's been pretty much empty. Um, did you during shut time. down or the city told you or how did it? Happen? Well, we all, yeah, everyone shut down, right? The Cuomo, we all went, you know, into sheltering in place and, uh, you know, gathering places especially shut down. So we did. We thought we were going to be gone for like two weeks, like many people did. And it's funny because the first time I went back in was in August or something and, um, or July and, uh, and you know, there was a Hamlet script there because we literally just sent the, uh, the Gate Hamlet company home, you know, Ruth Nega and the whole team and Yael uh, Farber. So we just sent everybody home that Monday and then we were supposed to have the jungle come the following Monday and we shut on Friday. So um, that's what it looked like when I came back in. So there was still scripts around um, David Colon, who works with us, and, and George uh, Castillo, our, our facilities manager, um, had kept the space really clean and nice. So it was beautiful to just walk in there, but very sad, you know, that it was empty. You know, we had our ghost light. It was very kind of dramatic. So, um, and then at one point, I guess, um, we, oh, I think things started to, um, turn around professionally uh, as a team when we um, when we figured out a way and got the inspiration to try to use our building. Um, if we couldn't bring people inside to actually take advantage of the fact that we're in a public park, that we're in Brooklyn Bridge Park. And so during the um, during the protests, we invited um, Kobe Proctor to come in uh, to uh, project 
do um, pho pho photography projections onto our wall. There were a group of guys who were looking to do sort of guerrilla um, projections on walls. And so they approached Jim Finley, who was our production supervisor. Um, and it turned out they didn't want to do it, but, uh, but Kobe did. And he's a wonderful street photographer, lives in Brooklyn, had incredible photographs of the protests. So we, we decided we're just going to turn it over. Um, and we have a great projector. Um, so what we did was we set it up and for three days a week, for probably like nine or 10 weeks, uh, we would just have these photo essays. Um, so Kobe's was up for like a couple of months and then and then um, he invited some other people to come in. And, and so he ended up curating a whole series. And what would happen is because we couldn't gather, we couldn't do any publicity. Um, and so people who were wandering in the park, which is a beautiful place to be in the evenings during the summer, would just happen upon these giant projections that looked so fantastic on our building. Um, and so that became a steady, a steady thing. And so people would wander and then suddenly they would be um, confronted by uh, this very political, very interesting work uh, that was very raw and very of the moment. Uh, we had this uh, woman, Jeanette Beckerman, uh, whose work also came on and she had actually done, been photographing protests um, for 10 years. So we had decades of protests. So there were, there were protests from, uh, you know, Trayvon Martin and uh, uh, gay rights. So there was a, it was a beautiful essay. I loved it. Um, so that's something that we ended up doing. We started calling it an urban canvas mm -hmm. and started using our facade that way. Thousands of people must have seen that then. They did because um, I think we figured out about 300 people a night would wander by. And so if you did that like 300 people a night and we did that every night for three weeks, you know, for, for like 10 weeks and three nights a week. So, you know, thousands of people got to see that. And, and what I love, even in the photographs, because um, Kobe uh, and our photographer, Teddy Wolf, took pictures of the pictures. And so you would see um, families and people with their kids and everybody interacting with the images because they were so big. So they would be taking pictures with them. They'd be, you know, imitating some of the imagery on, on the screen. It was, um, it was wonderful. It was just, so that kind of started us feeling like, okay, we're, we're alive, we're doing things. Um, and then uh, we also were treating our building. So we, uh, we, we uh, upgraded our ventilation system, you know, by adding these higher level uh, filters. We mm -hmm. an ionization system that goes throughout the whole building and um, makes it safer uh, because through ionization, the molecules, the aerosolized molecules of the virus get attached to others and they fall to the ground so they don't linger in the air longer. So we started to just set up you know, the making this that the the room and the building safe for an eventual uh, return, um, and that's um, so we did a lot. We did a lot to the building. We're still finishing up things like wayfinding, but we have sanitizers and um, touchless towel things. And anyway, we that was a big a big um, effort that we also put into place while we were um, closed, um, and then. Uh, I saw uh, a, um, a porch concert that Blake Zidell, who's our publicist, sent me. It was Bill Frizzell and a couple of musicians doing a porch. They were doing a porch concert uh, in, in Brooklyn. Um, and they were wearing masks, three of them. And then there were people just sitting on the street, uh, socially distanced. And I thought, hmm, that looks really great. We don't have uh, a stoop, but we have a roof and we have a balcony. So we got the idea that we would invite musicians to come and play on the roof. And with sort of the same idea that the people in the park who were already there would be the people who would be the recipients of that, um, of that music. And it was really kind of great because ever since we got down there, we were always saying like, how do we bring the people of the park into our building? How do we expand our audience? And then we were like, well, this was a different situation. We were gonna bring the art to people. So that was really a, a great um, benefit of, of 
having such a wonderful space and being in Brooklyn Bridge Park and it's, you know, beautiful setting, sunset under the Brooklyn Bridge. <clears throat> so we did about 12 of those. Uh, we just finished last week and we had wonderful musicians like um, Bill Frizzell and uh, Eli Fola and um, Mark Rebo. Uh, there were many, many, Stu played, um, uh, Bobby Previtt played. It was really fun. Damon Dono and Nathan Kochi from Oklahoma played. So it, 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 it started to be something that um, was like a reawakening, I think. Like the first night it was Bill Frizzell. And I remember the first time hearing live music and we were, you know, we were sitting on these benches underneath and we're looking up and the music started to play. And it was a very, it, it was an incredible feeling because you could, you could just feel it viscerally. And then like within five minutes, it was the most natural thing. And people were, you know, kind of swaying to the music and we sort of had gotten over the shock to the system and it was the most natural thing ever. So I've, I really felt like we should not worry about the future. You know, art will always do what it does and people need it. And it's not a question, it's a, it's a reality that people need it and they are nurtured by it. And it's something that I totally believe will will return. I had a similar feeling going into the Metropolitan Museum and seeing art, you know, on the walls for the first time and you know their 150th anniversary. So they have like the greatest hits collection on the walls. So you're seeing Caravaggio's and you're seeing, you know, all the European art, and then you're going into the American wing. And it was uh, quite wonderful to understand that. Um, timelessness, you know, that we always talk about and hear about, but then to actually feel it. Um, and then to see people in their masks, this contrast, and it's a way of people being together, but having to be socially distant. It was, it's complicated. It, it, it captures the complexities of things that bring us together. And yet we kind of have to be apart. So there's a certain there's a certain po poignancy in all of that. Yeah, I feel. Yeah. So, so, are you worried about the future of Saint Anne's? How is it for you at the moment? Um, well, it's we're not open. I mean, we can we can we've been doing these outside things. We also have an art. We made an art gallery out of our archways. So. We just finished the concerts um, and I don't know what the future is going to bring it. I don't know when we're going to be able to open to live audiences. Um, we, we can do workshops. We can do things that museums can do. We can have exhibits. We can do workshops. We can do some film and media. You know, all the guidelines that have been um, created by the state that we can fit, we're allowed to do. Um, but, you know, that's a whole that's a whole programming initiative unto itself. So figuring out what that will be is kind of the next step. Um, I'm also on a task force with, with um, you know, the, with Rebecca Robertson from, from the Armory and Alex Poots from The Shed and Pat Cruz from Harlem Stage, Shade Lithcott, um, Leslie Koch. You know, we all have um, theaters that we would consider to be flexible cultural spaces. So we've been working um, with, the, with the state to create guidelines just for flexible spaces that don't have the constraints of fixed seating that are the most dangerous, I guess, in the sense of um, COVID. Um, but you know, having these big open spaces and robust ventilation systems and uh, cross ventilation in terms of egress and exits and, and um, ionization, you know, all those things I was talking to you before that we've been trying to work with the state to understand that our industry, like the restaurant industry, like many uh, industries can also open incrementally. Um, we don't have to just wait, you know, for a year when, um, you know, Broadway can open, that we all have something to contribute um, earlier on that can give people a place, particularly artists and technicians and all the, the, um, 
the uh, industries that are related to our industry, that there are ways for us to be able to try to open incrementally, um, just the way restaurants have. You know, that they don't want to put people at risk for sure. Um, and we have to pay attention to what's going on with the virus. Nobody wants to uh, spread it in any way, shape or form. Um, but we want to have a pathway whereby our industry can open. Because it was, it was pointed out to me very poignantly by Mark Rebo, a great guitarist. He played on our roof and it, you know, it was the first time he'd played in a while. Uh, and, and we were talking and he said, do you understand that we have no place to work? That every place that we would work is not allowed to open. We can't work in bars. We can't work in clubs. We can't work. We can't work. And I, you know, I started thinking about that very, very much because it's not only about the audiences, but it's really about all the artists who have lost work, the crews that we had to let go. People lost 12 weeks of work when we closed down because the job canceled. So, and all the artists in the jungle, it's like so many people who were going to be coming to America and their work gone. I mean, it was kind of devastating. It's, in, it's devastating internationally, right? Not just, yeah. not just for us. So, um, so that's what we're trying to do is to get a pathway. Uh, you know, not if it can't happen right now because of the COVID problems across the country. Um, New York's doing well, so we're, you know, we're keeping our fingers crossed on that. Uh, but we want to have a pathway, and we want to be able to uh, work with the government to come up with guidelines that would make it safe with the state and the city. So that's kind of that's kind of what I've been doing, mm -hmm. uh, and my staff's been, you know working the ones that are that are here are working hard mm. so um <clears throat> seeing all the protests the black lives matter the images of your building um what you said you know normally we always thought how do we get the people from the park also to participate come inside but now so you did something for them there um is something do you feel something is changing is something um, in or reconnecting Um, I think I think things have to change. I mean, one of the one of the byproducts of the um, of this shutdown is that for nonprofits, at least for St. Anne's, you know, you know, nonprofits, the way we're funded um, in particular is is through a very balanced way. So you have you know you have. Uh, philanthropy, you know, individual giving, you have government giving, you have foundation giving, you have earned income. So you have a, a whole balanced combination. I, who are we, who are we serving and how are we serving them and who is supporting us in the work that we're doing? So we're not an end in itself. We are the means is what I'm trying to say. And mm -hmm. so the support for being the deliverer of the services, to, for being the home for it, the umbrella, the nurturers, whatever you want to call us, um, the perpetuators, the, you know, um, you need that balance. And so with the earned income just gone, it sort of changes the, uh, the, the dynamics. It certainly changes the numbers. Um, so our organizations pretty much our budgets cut by, you know, a third to a half. So that's mm -hmm. one thing. But what it also does is it gives you the opportunity to not worry about whether or not you're going to sell tickets. So you're no longer thinking about a marketplace. You're really thinking about or we're thinking about what is it we can do? What is it we can give? How can we how can we how can we make things better? How can we contribute to whatever will be a recovery? Because we're not even at a recovery yet. So it's kind of like, how do we do our jobs um, without, quote unquote, earning it, you know, without making people pay for it? It's mm -hmm. not about that right now. So now it's about opening up, opening up the doors. So that's, that's, been a, that's been a change in a good way. Um, so we're not recruiting audiences, you know, we're, 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 we're assuming that the world is our audience, it, it, certainly the world of the park, which is 
you know, a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. It's a beautiful park to be able to add music to it is, you know, and, and, and visual art is wonderful. I think in terms of next year, I mean, we will probably have to start thinking about how we return, you know, when can we start bringing international companies back? You know, we put the jungle on hold that was supposed to do a whole tour. Will we be able to bring them back? You know, we're all in touch with each other, the company, Good Chance, Stephen Daldry, Justin, uh, David Land. So, and, and also the issues that the jungle is about, yeah. you know, immigration, what's going on. You know, Good Chance is working on a, um, a tour of a, of a puppet. They have this giant puppet called Little Amal, who's going to walk across the continent of Europe looking for her mother and artists will greet her in all the different countries that they step through. So Little Amal was based on the character in the jungle. So we're trying to, you know, help with that and to be part of it and to keep the commitments that we feel um, strongly about and the causes that we feel strongly about to stay, stay connected to those. Um, you know, so I had an experience because we were supposed to be doing an end of Walsh play that probably would be going on right now. So they did a live stream of a, of a, of a version of it uh, about a month or two ago. And I was able to watch it. And I, I actually felt like I was sitting up in the balcony somewhere, either that or I was in heaven. You know what I mean? Like I was looking down, I could see my friends, I could see the artists on stage and it was a great, it was a great um, performance. And just being able to be there just made it all the more uh, immediate that we have to we have to do it. We have to bring them back, and they have to finish the work. Same thing with Emma Rice. You know, these are great artists. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, meeting Kobe and um, and the work that he did on the projections. You know, we're going to keep working with him, so that'll be a new relationship. You know, a curatorial relationship. So. Hopefully we'll be doing projections again in the spring and, and hopefully with music as well, we'll be doing more outdoor per performances. <clears throat> How far we get with the indoor thing, I think we'll, we'll pursue it as far as we safely can. And then we'll start, um, probably we'll start doing some workshops and then see what comes of those before we uh, do some live concerts inside. And, yeah. and do, I don't know when we'll do plays again. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we just got an email um, from our friends in Tia Varsova. They were about to open The Tempest and one of the actors' wife or the actors that got COVID, they have to cancel, you know, the, the entire opening. It's incredible to think about, you know, it's a reopening of a season and, and how much it is also in a new space they are planning. So it's so much uncertainty, but, um, and I feel very connected, you know, I, I've, I've known Jegarsh for many years now. Yeah. Like 20, not maybe not 20, but 15 or something. And, you know, we did Macbeth together in the tobacco warehouse before it became our home. Love um, but, you know, he's writing me, you know, every day, what's happening with the election? Are you going to be okay? <clears throat> it's an international community. Like, you know, they, yeah. they, they've been in the streets there in Poland. Like when he sent me the um, the announcement of the Tempest, I was like, I should be there. I should be watching this show. <laughs> yeah. So it is risky. It's risky. It's risky to program, and it's risky not to program. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's really a time where we really don't know things, which is not so, uh, we are not used to it. And many parts of the world, that's normal. They do not know what, how they can feed their children the next week, where their job is, what the political situation is, will there be a war or not? And, uh, but for us, it's a, it's, a, you know, it's a shocking confrontation with the reality that um, we, we didn't expect. You said- um, and you, have to feel, you have to feel the empathy about it. You know, you have to feel in the moment like when you say, how are you meeting it? There's a certain amount of programming or planning you can do, but I think for, I think being in the moment, seeing how you feel, <clears throat> how your people feel, and also feeling what the audience, what people are going through. Yeah. And 
the key for me is not to be demanding anything from anybody, but rather to be trying to, you know, ease, ease the problem, ease the, the suffering, ease, ease the difficulty. And as artists to just use our imagination because we do come up with things that nobody would thought would think about. You know, we do come up with solutions. We do come up with ways of thinking about things that are, I guess that's what creative means. <laughs> and it mm -hmm. is an art and we do have a creative industry. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mm. So it needs to be active and it needs to find its voices as we keep moving. Same thing with yeah. the protest movement. To me, they're very interlocked, you know, creating art and getting art out there in the moment and then having this, this very visceral response to what's going on, act, actualizing in front of our eyes has been really remarkable to me. I think, I think that movement has been so brave and so strong and such a leadership, <clears throat> Black Lives Matter. You know, anybody who says, you know, all lives matter. Yeah, Black Lives Matter is, is a leadership movement and it means all lives matter. If, if one doesn't, none do. So that's so important. And I believe that that, um, I think that will also change things. Mm -hmm. And you for sure remember the civil rights movement, you know, in America in a way. I do for sure remember that. Where, where were you at that time? Um, I was graduating high school in 1966. In New York? Yeah. Yeah. I grew up in, I grew up in Rockaway. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I very much remember 1968, you know, which when I think about now, you know, and I have to sometimes when I talk to the staff, remind them, I'm not saying it's not bad now, <clears throat> but I'm saying it was bad then. Yeah. And, you know, we had two leaders assassinated in one year, Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy. We had federal troops on the streets in Chicago. We had National Guards on college campuses. The abuse of power and the corruption was as horrific as it is now. So it's not like, it's not, I'm not, I'm not saying that from the point of view, it's like, we'll get through it. I'm not saying it that way at all. I'm saying it has lasting effects and um and we have to be vigilant and we have to take care and be on the case <clears throat> sorry sorry i'm coughing so much it's because i'm talking so much yeah yeah you're, you're talking yeah and thank you really for sharing and um, and, and uh, so important to listen to you so how did you get into theater why did you say in the time whatever you see protests or you say oh, what what was your path what what motivates you then and even now what is what's your reason well when i was uh, when i finished college like i graduated college in 1970 you studied uh, history or uh, just liberal arts liberal but arts. but those were the years when colleges were shut down <clears throat> because of the anti-war movement so I never even had a proper graduation <clears throat> because the college was closed. And um, so like I right now, was doors were closed and uh, no classes inside. Uh, that's right. And the, the actual, uh, the actual graduations weren't held. So I got my diploma, but <clears throat> we didn't have a proper graduation and, you know, the country was in crisis. And the, um, the issue of deaths was around the body count of the Vietnam War, which became the big mobilizing factor and the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement were coming together. Um, so that was a big part of, that was my formative years for mm -hmm. me. You know, that was, that was what I graduated from into the world. And I had a, you know, very strong, uh, feeling. I was a, I was a baby of the counterculture, loved Bob Dylan, you know, rock and roll. <clears throat> Sorry. And then, and I understood the connection between music and politics. It was very, they were very connected. And so that was just in my, in my being. And so I started working in, uh, I guess, 
it was um, alternative education in the 1970s. I'm sorry, I keep coughing. It's terrible. No, don't worry. I'm just trying to cough. <clears throat> so you, you in education, so you did... Um... So, so I was working in education, and that was where I was sort of... At first, I was involved with, like... <clears throat> I was interested in change. So I was working with adults, and I was working with adults who, had, you know, had been in prison and giving them adult education. Eventually, I was working with... Um, these uh, uh, therapeutic communities, you know, there's a lot of uh, anti-drug money then mm -hmm. and manpower money to uh, lift people up and help them get jobs and all that. So I was in that kind of job training. And then I started working with kids. And over time, I started working with theater with kids. And then I decided I wanted to learn theater. And so I went to study with uh, Jean Frankel and so I started being interested in theater and he was a pretty powerful director at the time and, you know, full of strong. And that just, it just sort of grew out of that. <clears throat> so you performed also then? In his no, I didn't work? perform. I never, I never was into performing. So you, what did you, you, you were an <clears throat> assistant director or you were an organized, um, um, produced? Well, what I did was I went to work with, I went to study with him and he was kind of chaotic. So he kind of needed a producer. So I kind of became his producer <clears throat> and then he needed a theater, a new theater. So I helped him find a theater and that's how I started meeting the landmarks people. And it was the end of the 1970s and early 1980s when New York city was starting to recover from sort of like, all the flight and all the the downturns of the 70s. So I kind of came into that and and got involved in a, a group called the Landmarks Conservancy that was involved in trying to save uh, historic buildings. And, and with Jean, we had started to do stuff in churches and alternative spaces. And I really enjoyed working with him and working on that. And so <clears throat> I took that forward. I got to know the people from the Landmarks Conservancy and I said, listen, you're into historic buildings. I'm into the arts. If you ever have a building that you want to put the arts into, let me know. I'd love to work with you on that. And so that's kind of how that whole thing happened. They called me up about St. Anne's Church. Mm -hmm. I was living in Park Slope at the time. Oh, no, sorry. I was living in Cobble Hill in Brooklyn. And they said, would you come and help us think about how we can activate this beautiful old church that has a small uh, a small parish and so i went to work for them <coughs> sorry no, no, i didn't have a cough cool. until i was talking to you frank maybe mm -hmm. i'm nervous i don't know mm -hmm. so that's how that all started and then you did your first the programming you brought an artist theater artist puppetry and uh... yeah and even before that it was like finding out what was going on in brooklyn because at that time there were these uh, cultural organizations, but <clears throat> they were small and local. And at that time, people basically would go to Manhattan for their culture. And Harvey Lichtenstein was at BAM, Joe Papp was at the public theater at that time. So mm -hmm. um, in being a consultant to the Landmarks uh, Conservancy, I went to meet with BAM and the public theater to say, oh, there's this beautiful old church in Brooklyn Heights. It, it's very inspiring space. It has great acoustics, has the first stained glass windows made in America. Is this you might want to work in or do have a satellite? Because I was a mm -hmm. consultant, I wasn't looking to start an organization. So uh, Harvey, <laughs> Harvey was interested but you know, he had BAM, so he didn't need a space. And Joe Papp's person said to me, we're General Motors, you should do something there. He said, you should make something out of that church for the arts. Um, so that's what happened. Hmm. Incredible, incredible story. Yeah, and then there were all these different um, arts organizations that I got to know and artists 
who were looking for space and looking for a support. <clears throat> and we became sort of a catalyst for them uh, to have that place. Hmm. And um, so when you invite artists, what do you look for? And you're also the one who brings global artists and national artists. What do you look for and why do you think we need to see their work? You know, that's actually the criteria. What you just said is what I'm looking for is who, who needs to see who's doing the work that we need to see. And that's what I'm looking for. And so when I travel or if I see work here, and also, is there a need for it? Um, in other words, there are many, many great cultural institutions, certainly in New York, who are covering certain kinds of bases. So St. Anne's doesn't need to do that. Mm -hmm. We don't have to be a producer, you know, or we don't have to be the theater company. We don't have to have a resident company because there are places who are doing that. What we have to do is be a receptor and a connector of what artists are doing that are not necessarily reaching American artists or American audiences. So that's the relationship that I'm interested in catalyzing. So that's the work I'm looking for. When I met Zegarz, for example, um, he and Varlakovsky, you know, they were like 30 something years old and they were the next generation of Polish artists coming out of a very political history. And they had been trained by Christian Lupa. So mm -hmm. this, was, this was work that to me was really transgressive and really interesting. Um, so I became very attracted to that work. And, uh, and I had a similar reaction to Enda Walsh. I had never heard of language like that, except for in rock and roll. So there was something very much uh, appealing to me about that, about those artists. And so it's very visceral. Um, it's emotional. The, cho the choices are emotional. Um, I found it important to try to bring uh, people and have them come back so that there would be a relationship built between them and our, our audiences. Um, I was interested in how coming to America and having American audiences could impact those particular artists. I know like um, Denise Goff is a good example, excuse me, mm -hmm. but she's a very good example of someone who was in people, places, and things, she was playing a character who was really double-edged. Like you didn't know if she, you know, she's a drug addict and kind of brilliant, but you just didn't know if she was gonna make it at the end of that play. And when we saw it in London, she, it was very, very, very bleak to me, like too bleak. Um, when we brought it to New York, the audience loved her and loved this character. And so her struggle for whether or not she was going to survive or get well was up for grabs. And she told me, um, Denise told me that when she used to go home after the show in London, she pretty much feel like the character was not gonna make it. When she came to New York and she saw how much the audience was rooting for her and found her funny and laughed and all those different things and much more outgoing, she would go and she'd feel like the character was gonna make it. And then that would fuel her in terms of her herself as an actress and the character and it would inform her performance. So to me, that's fantastic. Um, we, many times um, we've been told like the Donmar Warehouse when they did the, um, the trilogy in London, when they first did Julius Caesar, they knew they had something really special and, and they did. And those, mm -hmm. those plays are phenomenal, but the critics were so harsh. And Philida Lloyd, who's the director and Kate Packenham, who was the executive producer, it was really important for them to bring it to New York. 
And they have said that when they got the got to New York and it got these great reviews in, in St. Anne's and this huge welcome and sold out performances, and it was a bigger arena than the little dinner. Um, and then the way that 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 we could u utilize space um, to transform uh, the prison, <coughs> prison uh, setting that reinvigorated them. And so then St. Anne's and the Donmar became linked mm -hmm. in terms of what was going to happen for the, for the next two plays. And in fact, they were there for the groundbreaking uh, of, our, of our building that we're in now. And then their Henry IV opened our building. So mm -hmm. these are deep relationships. Yeah, yeah. The you and the Shabuna, oh yes, that, that returning to rents. I, I have been thinking about that play every day during this election. Yeah, it was incredible work you showed. So significant political in the right sense and great theater, yeah. And also it wasn't the, it wasn't the, it was a sleeper for Thomas, right? Like returning to rents, they expected it to, to be a, um, a hit. You know what I mean? Like they were, they were experimenting with this book yeah. by DJ EDA, Erebon. And so it, it's another perfect example of, of how St. Anne's program. So we get to know the Shabuna. I had met Nina Haas in an elevator at a Lou Reed event years before. Mm -hmm. And when I read about it at Manchester, I said, oh, this is something we should try to do. And then we got it together and we did it and we brought them. And it, it resonated so perfectly because it was about why was this working class German community that, uh, French community, sorry, yeah. that DDA had, had grown up in, why were they voting for Marie Le Pen? Why was that? And he was really trying to figure this out. And how did that affect he was and his identity? I have been thinking about that so much during this election. Yeah. I mean, like yeah. how is how is it that half of our country is so conservative and so half of our country is so progressive i mean i just i i don't understand how people you know could want to turn the clock back on race on gender on women's rights on progressive education on science like it's it's a mystery right but having done that piece and seen that the history of what happened in France and Europe, I felt like that was something that could that could organize a thinking around it that we didn't have here, yeah. like a political thinking about class, about the politics that we just don't think that way here. We don't talk that way here. We mm -hmm. we're 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 just different. <laughs> so I felt like that had something to offer. And also, I think what it showed that there is a dramaturgy, an idea that is, you know, at the work, instead of, let's say, writing a play where a family sits at the table and the father and the young daughter have a discussion. This is a play based on a novel of a, someone for real, Didier Eribon, went back to his hometown to meet his parents, his family, who all of a sudden voted for this truly right-wing Le Pen. And, um, and he tried to understand. It was archival footage. Uh, Whatever. So, and then Thomas went from the shop and went back with him, and they took, you know, images, videos, and then under the idea they would do a documentary film, and then they end up in a cutting studio and discuss and the director, the sound engineer, and, and Nina Hosley, the, the, the actress who does the voiceover, and they discuss the work. Such an intelligent, beautiful, multi layered idea, and uh, something, yeah, we haven't seen here, and it's. Um, there's something what the Wooster Group also normally does such complex plays like the LSD or the um, or, or many other things um, and they did um, and so it was uh, something a contribution which we would not know about and you also gave them a long run normally it's a couple of days right yeah we gave them we gave them I think we did it like three weeks which was yeah it's a big risk also, and also unheard of for them <clears throat> because they do they do a lot of touring in festivals and. But it also, what also happened with that situation was DDA didn't want to come over to do a talk, but Edouard Louis came over and he mm -hmm. was a good friend of DDA Airbonds. And so he gave a talk, 
that was absolutely riveting, you know, about the connection between um, uh, poverty and violence, you know, and, um, and, and being gay and being young, a young gay guy coming out. And, and we brought back his play the next year, History of Violence, um, mm -hmm. and we actually helped commission it um, with the Schaubühne. And we hope to bring his next one, you know, Who Killed My Father, Mm -hmm. Also really interesting that that um, Thomas Ostermeyer just directed it. Evo Van Hol directed it. So there are these thinkers like Edouard and and mm -hmm. and these you know deeply <clears throat> radicalized voices who are really really special. Um, you know Eric Berryman is another a young um, black artist working with um, the Worcester Group. He did that piece called the B-side, which went into the prison songs of the state penitentiaries from the '60s on. And you know, we're going to work with we're going to work with him and Kate again on on the next piece. So, it's not just like how do you program a season. It's really like what's the long term what's the long term commitment in terms of what are people thinking about and learning about that we need we as a culture need or what I feel we need, or I don't know. Mm. What do you say to this idea that people say, now we maybe have to go back. You never do the kind of the big festivals, but still artists fly in with airplanes and stay and then leave right away. And, um, and then there's also community. How do you find a balance? How, how, and did this time we live in now, did, did it change something? Or this reconfirming what you always thought was the right thing to do? Well, it makes me want to, it makes me want to do and try to figure out how to do more local programming. Hmm. You know, how to, how to collaborate with um, American theaters and New York companies. <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, because I'm thinking now is a very important time for us to be looking inward and for us as a culture to be talking and and writing and performing about our feelings, especially especially in the in the black community. Like that seems very, very fertile right now as a place where the white institutions need to just break down the doors, you know, like and you have to do it in a kind of organic way. So what do we have to do? Let us know. What do you think we have to do? I don't know. I think we have to, we have to get involved. We have to get involved in a very different way. We just have to engage. You know, relate. It's relationship building is really what it's about. You can't just change. You have to build relationships. So I think that's where I'm, where I'm looking, and I think that's where our Eric and I are looking. I don't know who's talking. I don't know, Blake. Please take your mic off. Mic, take. Maybe can you all? Uh, yeah, take him off the, uh, the screen. Um, or mute or mute him. Um, okay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So I think that is also I think what you say to have long lasting um, artistic um, collaboration. But I especially, I, I, I think what is important in your work that you do also international global uh, global programming because we it's a big island, America. So the voices on the streets, the diversity on the streets, we, we hardly see in the commercial theater, very little. And also in the plays, they often seem to come from London. Um, but I think your programming really is such a rich uh, contribution, you know, towards what we call world theater like there's a world music you're so close to the music uh, world um but also we all musicians listen to musicians from around the world to inform their local practices and i think saint Anne's is a place it would be so hard to to um, yeah reconnect to it if it's so much funding lost will audiences come back when it might take a year to open again right uh, i don't know what is your what what do you think what what does your task force think 
in case even let's say a year but how long will it take that people come back what are there any thoughts um about time yeah well at the risk of i i don't want to get into a, a heavy conversation about mm -hmm. the the soul sucking conversation of our current leadership i don't want to get into that conversation but I honestly mm -hmm. believe that um, that we will not get well under this leadership. So if there is a change in the in the presidency, um, and there's a commitment to getting well, I think I think we have a chance. So uh, I I believe that very strongly. I believe. I believe very strongly we, we cannot get well under this situation because there's no interest in that and it's a death, it's a death trip. So, um, so let's get through this election. That's the first thing, Like The first thing is, are we saving our country or not? So if we're saving our country, then we can start to think about how we, how we recover. Um, so that's the uncertainty. Uh, one of the things that opened up my thinking and took me out of depression during this, these last few months, and I think opened up the door to doing the concerts on the roof, was I couldn't live with so much uncertainty. And so I was looking for one thing I could feel certain about. And that was the one thing I felt certain about, that as long as this guy is president, we will not get well. And somehow knowing that certainty for myself I was like, okay, so in the meantime, what can we do? And that was kind of like, we're not gonna talk about opening. We're not gonna worry about that. We're gonna just bring art to people. We're gonna try to make people suffering less. We're gonna try to have a voice. We're gonna try to give voice to others. And that is what we're gonna do. And that is what our job is. And so that's what we did all summer long. So I'm still in that mode, um, hoping that if opening is the answer, that's that's the answer once we know that we can recover. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that's my answer to your question. It's like, Very yeah, we'll one. get back to we'll get back to bringing artists from overseas. We'll get back to we'll, we'll we'll build relationships now, and we'll do workshops, and we'll prepare for the summer. And it'll only be a few months, and we can get back on the roof. And you know, we will just keep our our, as much artistic life happening as we can. Mm. If you could share, what, what, what might be dreams like one day, what, or you say, what are artists you look up to? What are people who you w want to bring? And uh, in a sense of, um, you know, we might not have heard of, you know, who should we pay attention to? Um, what, um, not that I'm asking about program at all, but what do you think, what art at the moment is um, um, is um, is of necessary. We have next week coming up. Actually, we're going to talk with Carol Martin uh, from NYU, who wrote about the theater of the real, the whole idea of documentary theater. And I think Return to Rhymes, in a way, um, um, is is part of it. We're going to have uh, Nick Kent from the Tricycle Theater in London, who you will know from that, that big great game, and uh, uh, Rabbi Murray, and then uh, Hotel Modern from Rotterdam. Um, but what do you think, what, what tendencies in theater will be, where will it be? Will it be uh, a documentary work? Might it be more work that reflects the grotesque and in comedy? Or is it, uh, um, will it be classics, a return that we heard from many artists who are going back to, you know, Indian classics, Greek classics, uh, European classics. What, what do you feel in your global view that you have? It's so interesting because we're doing, we're about to stream two concerts that were kind of seminal to St. Anne's, right? They changed the, uh, they changed who we are and, and who we became. You know, we always say we, we meet at the intersection of theater and rock and roll. And so we're about to, to stream the two big rock and rollers that, that were made into films because we also didn't want to stream just archival stuff. So we're going to do Songs for Drella, which was the reunion of Lou Reed and John Cale. And then we're going to do Lou Reed's Berlin, which, um, you know, was a, was a piece that he had made. It was an album he made. 
he it was panned he put it away for years it was never done live then we did it live then it was made into a film i mean well it's never really been shown here so it's like i was saying to to um to Lori anderson you know lose lose um widow and julian schnabel who's the director of the film yesterday i said it seems like we have to rescue Berlin again because it's from obscurity. And oh, and now we're gonna look at Andy Warhol again. And now it turns out it's some big anniversary of Andy Warhol. So mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting to me that we're going back and looking at two seminal films, but these are artists that were very, very committed and very in the moment of their time. Um, Certainly when, when Andy Warhol, when they made the, um, the tribute, <clears throat> when Lou and John reunited to make that film, uh, to make that, that concert, that was an important thing because <clears throat> he had recently.